Okay, this video is part eight of obesity causes with the emphasis talking about the effect of stress on obesity and the effect of diabetes on obesity. Okay, so this first slide here is just an overview saying basically, you know, the sooner you get your act together as an adult, the better, um, hopefully by 35 years of age, just because your body has a lot of reserve to sort of fix the damage caused by a bad diet and toxicology up until you're about 30, 35. After that, you have progressively less reserve. You become more fragile and you end up all fat and sick. And basically, you know, I'm trying to help you. I don't make any money for this. I, I feel sorry for your patients. I mean, I just see one after another sad, pathetic disaster. I was just talking to a lady, internal medicine friend of mine, and she said most of her patients over 60 years of age are cognitively impaired. And so basically, if you keep plugging up your arteries, all herbivores, humans are herbivores, they get all their arteries plugged up, plugs up arteries to your brain, you become stupid, to the Johnson impotent, to the heart, you get, either you die or you get treatments for that. And so basically, you either get your act together, low fat vegan, low sodium vegan is the best way to go, and everything works, die old age, or you end up with your arteries plugged up, and it's going to be drug, 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 then surgeries, chop, chop, chop. Bye bye money, dead at 75, okay? In, in that ballpark, okay, or, or sooner than that. I'm just showing you that's basically the way it goes. Um, I see this all day long, every day. There's no mystery about it. All right, um, so first of all, I'll talk a little bit about stress. Stress, you know, elevates cortisol, especially in the initial phase of stress. It's especially um, adrenaline and noradrenaline, you know, get you hyper energized to meet a stressful situation. You know, you're getting chased by a pack of wolves, climb a tree or something. All right. But stress, you know, especially the more chronic effect from the cortisol will suppress the immune system, making you more vulnerable to infections and more vulnerable to cancer. Okay. And there's lots of papers to this effect. You know, just, you just routinely find these papers in two seconds, suppressing the NK cells. So you can't remove cancer cells and you die cancer. All right. That's one thing. Um, vicious cycle of obesity. So what happens here is uh, when a person's fat, they fat they start leaking uh, fatty acids into the blood, which can cause insulin resistance and contribute to all that. This article is about sympathoexcitation in obese male rats, role of brain insulin. Okay, so uh, with insulin resistance, you're also going to have increased sympathetic nerve activity, and that's going to activate the stress response in this sense. Without a overt emotional stress in the moment, you're just activating it by eating the high fat diet and becoming obese. Okay. And then that's going to lead to other problems like hypertension and you're going to get this whole negative cycle going. Oh, one quick picture I wanted to show about uh, the benefit of social support. Here's an old guy. His legs are paralyzed and you can see the whole family's taking care of him. The, the painting is called Filial Piety, the Paralytic by Jean Baptiste Grusa, 1763. So what I love about this painting is it totally captures the benefit of social support. And this old guy would be dead without it, of course. And there's something called the Rosetto Effect. Rosetto Effects from Pennsylvania. There were these Italian families. They all lived together, extended families in the same house or next door to each other. You'd have the grandparents, their kids, and the children, the grandchildren, and sometimes the cousin as well, all living in the same house. And the point was the Italian families in Rosetto had much healthier, longer lives than demographically matched populations, including if you match for alcohol and cigarettes, etc. And the reason is they had a good support system. If Luigi's, you know, working by himself down in the city, he loses his job and he's got no family contacts, he's screwed, okay? He can't pay his rent, he's ejected from his apartment, he can't buy food, he's homeless and starving. All right, if Luigi's living with his extended family, you know, if he doesn't have a job for a couple of months, they'll feed him, he's got a roof over his head, They'll maybe help him to find a new job. Luigi's going to be just fine. He's less stressed out. And there's a lot of negative health consequences for chronic uh, stress. Okay, here's one of the things, chronic excitation of the sympathetic nervous system. So basically, there's two types of nervous system. There's sympathetic and there's uh, parasympathetic. So sympathetic is fight or flight. Um, it's especially designed for acute situations. In the modern world, we, of course, often have chronic stress. Parasympathetic is more like feed and breed, rest and digest. So what happens when you eat a high-fat diet? It has an effect to increase sympathetic activity in the body. And that means acutely the catecholamines and adrenaline that will cause higher blood pressure. On a more long-term basis, chronic stress, you'll elevate cortisol more, and that causes increased fat accumulation, especially visceral fat, perhaps the worst type of fat in the belly. Um, the deep uh, part of the belly, abdomen fat. 
but this is all a negative cycle here. The high fat diet is making you hypertensive and then it's causing you to become fatter. So it's feeding back on itself. All right, then in addition, insulin resistance and obesity will cause decreased ability of insulin to cross the blood brain barrier. That's bad. When you got decreased insulin going to the brain, that means you'll have insulin resistance in the brain. And that means you can't get enough glucose into your neurons to have them function optimally. And over time, this leads to cognitive decline. I'm gonna show in this lecture a couple examples of how diabetes makes people stupider. And I can tell you, it is so common, uh, hypertension and diabetes in older population. And these diabetic patients, it's so sad. They're so cognitively slow. You just feel sorry for them. They're pathetic, okay? And they sit around, they're going blind, they're getting their feet amputated, they're going into kidney failure. You know, they usually die before they're on chronic dialysis. They don't make it that far. They usually die of coronary artery disease. But I, mean, I see a bunch of them getting amputated every day. It's just, just sad. It's a disaster. And a typical diabetic thinks they're doing okay. A typical diabetic and their family will tell you, oh, he's diabetic, but it's okay. It's under control. It's under control. Yeah, right. Okay, so some things that hyperinsulinemia does. So we talked about the main thing that causes hyperinsulinemia is a high-fat diet, especially saturated fat, but everything that goes with the high-fat diet, the high dietary sodium, the lack of plant foods, therefore the lack of potassium, the lack of magnesium, um, excessive psychological stress causing elevated cortisol and the catecholamines and elevated blood sugars and whatnot and the fat accumulation in the body and the obesity then secondarily feeding back more fatty acids into the blood and you know, perpetuating the cycle. Okay, we talked about high insulin. It goes to the liver. It blocks the production and release of insulin-like growth factor binding protein. So the net result is you get increased insulin-like growth factor in the blood, ILGF. When you have elevated ILGF and insulin, you then have increased activation of mTOR, mechanistic or mammalian target of rapamycin, which is the building contractor waiting for all the building parts before it builds, if you will. And when I say builds, I mean helping the cell to grow, and especially what we're concerned about is helping the cell to replicate. Because a typical somatic cell, meaning a non-germ cell, and a non-stem cell only gets about 60 divisions. Hayflick was a microbiologist working with human tissue culture, and he found that typical human cell only can divide 60 times, and it goes into senescence and dies. And so what's the whole point? If you're unnecessarily overactivating mTOR, you're accelerating aging by reaching the Hayflick limit sooner. Um, the reason a cell might only divide 60 times is because they can't replicate, replicate the end of the chromosomes um, without the telomerase enzyme, which most of these cells don't have. So the chromosome gets a little shorter with each division, and by about 60, you start encroaching upon uh, proton, you know, genes that make pro proteins that the cell really needs, so the cell can't uh, function without them. Um, you also, when you accelerate replication from excessive activation of mTOR, you increase replication of cancer, so the patient dies sooner. Okay, there's very good reasons. There's not just one reason why meat increases the risk of cancer. I, I've counted them in the past. There's like about 30 reasons. And T. Colin Campbell spoke about this at length. He said every time he looked for another mechanism of meat increasing cancer risk, he would find it. And he very quickly, you know, rattled off 10 of them. It, it, it's actually, when you look into detail, you'd be amazed how easy it is to show that meat increases cancer risk in numerous ways. Okay, um, having elevated insulin, elevated mTOR, that stimulates lipogenesis, meaning the production of fat, the storage and accumulation of fat. It makes you fat. <laughs> um, that's what you don't want, okay? You'll also accumulate fat in the liver, and that's diabetes of the liver, if you will. And so we're going to talk more about that in just a moment. We talked about increased sympathetic the obesity and the hyperinsulinemia and the high fat diet, they're gonna have the effect of increasing the sympathetic autonomic nervous system. SANS is what I usually call it. S-A-N-S is how to abbreviate it. And so that's gonna increase cortisol. That's associated with insomnia, high blood pressure, atherosclerosis, everything you don't want. Immunosuppression, you're more vulnerable to infections and increased cancer. Everything you don't want. You can't win with fat. And all the fats have problems with them. There's, there's no way to win with fats. You know, we, we've talked about this in other lectures. I got entire lectures on olive oil, entire lectures on fish oil. Um, imbalanced insulin action and chronic overnutrition, uh, some of the mechanisms. Um, all right, well, I'm going to go into that paper right now. Let's see here. Oh, briefly, I just want to say a word or two about caffeine because caffeine elevates the same hormones as stress. So it's basically a stress equivalent. Sleep deprivation does the same thing. But it's kind of strange, but caffeine is very popular with highly educated people. It is routine 
to see a whole bunch of doctors walking around making rounds and talking about how much they love coffee. And I drank it too. I started drinking it when I did a surgical internship because I was sleep deprived. I was on call every third night up much of the night. But it is not a health food, okay? In this one paper, it was decreasing blood flow to the brain by an average of 27%, which sounds a little high, but it's still important to realize it's a vasoconstrictor to brain blood flow, okay? And simultaneously, you know, mimicking the acute stress response like cortisol and the chronic stress response, it's going to be increasing the amount of glutamate as a neurotransmitter in the hippocampus neurons of the brain, the memory center. And that's an excitatory neurotransmitter. So it's going to increase the metabolic rate of the neurons. And then you've heard me talk about this Rogers theory of dementia. You have neurovascular uncoupling. So what am I saying here? If you increase the metabolic demand of a neuron, then you need increased nutrient supply. Well, here's a problem. How are you going to increase nutrient supply when you're dropping the blood supply to the brain? That's a no-no. You don't want that. And you start combining this with additional problems, and you've got a big problem. High-fat meal causing blood sludge, rouleau formation. You're going to drop oxygen delivery to tissues about 15 to 20%. And then you superimpose on that. Well, there's a lot of salt on that high-fat junk food. Well, guess what? Sodium is a vasoconstrictor. So now you're narrowing the arteries even more on top of the caffeine-induced vasoconstriction. Now you've got fat-induced lack of oxygen delivery, hypoxia. And then you're going to simultaneously ramp up the rates of neuronal transmission, neuronal activity, the neuron activity in the, in the hippocampus. Stupid. You're moving the metabolic rate farther and farther away from the oxygen and glucose delivery, and that's going to cause cells to be vulnerable to go into programmed cell death, apoptosis. So a cell that's uh, deprived for a prolonged amount of time of oxygen and glucose, it eventually reaches the point where it cannot meet its metabolic demands, and it goes into a cascade of reactions called apoptosis, or programmed cell death. And when it's specifically due to glutamate um, excesses, then it's called excitotoxicity. There's entire books on that subject, lots of papers on that subject. So you see what I'm saying? It's not good for your brain. Okay, now don't get me wrong. If you're exhausted and you have to make a long drive and there's no way out of it, yeah, drink some coffee so you're awake for that one particular drive. But as a habit, it's a bad idea. And the older we get, the more fragile we get. So it's good to quit it, okay? This is just going to go into more detail. Uh, first of all, all of the profitable foods, you know, have this big mythology wrapped around them. You know, like milk, they used to say for decades was good for your bones and the calcium. But milk actually causes osteoporosis. And you're going to have lots of people who think coffee is a health food. You know, the same person who thinks coffee is a health food is the same person who um, talks about how bad stress is. Well, it does the same thing. Okay, coffee is not a health food. Um Caffeine, you don't want to be taking caffeine. You don't need to, okay? You're just giving yourself excessive stress, causing problems, a little bit of insomnia. You don't sleep as deep. Okay, um, but like I said, every big moneymaker food has this mythology around it, you know? It's like, um, all right, uh, caffeine's a stress equivalent. We talked about here's the effects of cortisol. It causes sodium retention, so it's also going to cause hypertension, high blood pressure. Sodium in the vasoconstrictor drives up blood pressure. Um, I one time had injured my back many years ago, and they gave me this uh, solumedrol taper of uh, corticosteroids, and I took it, and then I had to get my blood pressure checked, and it was like really high. That's the only time I had high blood pressure in my life, and I was like, holy crap, wow, that's a powerful medicine. And it was totally asymptomatic. I didn't know. I was surprised by it. I immediately stopped taking that crap. Um, suppresses immune function. We talked about that. Increases gluconeogenesis, the production of glucose in the liver. Uh, leading to elevated blood glucose levels because that blood sugar produced in the liver gets released into the blood. Um, increases blood lipids. So you, you really want to be increasing your blood free fatty acids and cholesterol. Uh, over time, chronic high uh, cortisol can lead to buffalo hump obesity with fat on the back of the neck. Also, it increases visceral fat, the deep belly fat, the kind that's bad because it connects directly with the liver through the portal vein. Okay, it's prothrombotic. Stress is prothrombotic. It increases uh, blood's fibrinogen. It's a major clotting factor. It's one of the acute phase reactant proteins released by the liver. So fibrinogen is a bridging molecule, sticks red blood cells together. Um, it's a major clotting factor. So you predispose yourself to a blood clot. Um, that's also why, you know, you don't want to stress out uh, papa or grandpa, okay? You know, you're going to give them a coronary artery event. Um, stress causes increased platelet aggregation, activation, it makes them stickier. They stick together. And that's bad, number one, because it can cause an acute event if the 
artery in the heart, for example, clots off, but it's bad on a chronic basis too because chronic high levels of platelet activation will form little clots around cancer cells that are shed into the blood. And we've talked about this before in my cancer lectures, that a tumor as small as one gram, or let's say, let's say you have a tumor as like a, a, a centimeter in diameter. Okay, that's going to shed millions of cancer cells into the blood every day. And our immune system's great. It removes them all. It's good at that. But if you got prothrombotic blood from all the stress and caffeine, it can form little clots around the cancer cells and hide them and cause them to metastasize more. You look that up, you find a paper on that in five seconds. Okay, catecholamines, you know, they increase blood pressure, cardiac contrility, they can cause palpitations, they can increase your risk of <clears throat> atrial fibrillation if you've got chronic cardiac ischemia. Um, let's see, we talked about the increased glutamate neurotransmitter. Oh, catecholamines are also having an immunosuppressant effect. Everybody knows cortisol is immunosuppressant, but the catecholamines, that means adrenaline and noradrenaline, are also immune suppressing. They do something called function like a siderophore. Sidero means iron, four, P-H-O-R-E means to transfer. And so they facilitate the transfer of iron to bacteria. Normally bacteria can't grow in our blood because they have no iron available, but this makes it easier for them. And of course cancer can't grow without a high supply of iron. So I would expect it probably increases the risk of cancer, but I have not yet confirmed that with a paper. Okay, calcium, caffeine causes, in stress, cause increased excretion of calcium in the urine. Well, guess what? That increases your risk of kidney stones. Not good. You know, over decades and decades and decades, it potentially contributes to your risk of decreased kidney function and kidney failure. Okay, what else? Um, when, you're, when you're stressed out, not only do you have more calcium going out in your urine, which is bad, can, that can contribute to osteoporosis as well, but you also void out more of your magnesium. That's your vasodilator. So you can see how you got a negative cycle going here cranking up your blood pressure and peeing out your vasodilator. That's not smart. That's not a good combination of events. Um, this paper suggests a potential negative effect on thyroid function. I'm not as sure about that. Here's a paper if you're curious about that. What is caffeine good for? Like I said, if you have a long drive and you're exhausted, yeah, you want to be awake for the drive. Okay, so what else are problems with caffeine? Uh, well, for example, let's talk about tea. A lot of people say, well, I don't drink coffee, but tea is good for you. I don't think so. <laughs> tea tends to accumulate, accumulate fluoride. Fluoride's a neurotoxin, lowers your IQ, and causes a lot of other problems. Uh, tea tends to concentrate aluminum. McDougall thinks aluminum is the most common cause of uh, dementia. I actually, I don't. I think ischemia is neurovascular uncoupling and deletories. And, you know, McDougall, I think he's the best doctor in the world, but I think I know more than he does about the brain. Okay, um, tea sometimes contains lead, according to this book by Adams called Food Forensics, a good book. Now, I don't know how common it is, how true it is, but all I'm saying is, you know, tea is another one of these products that's acquired this mythology of it being this wonderful thing. And, you know, I would be very cautious about that. Okay, uh, the, the coffee habit becomes an obligation. For example, I used to drink two cups of coffee a day in the morning for about 15 years, and I'd often do procedures in the morning. Sort of my background was I was an imaging-guided surgeon called an interventional radiologist, and um, I also subsequently went on to become a neuroradiologist, etc. But the reason I tell you that is I would have to do procedures in the morning, and I remember how the coffee would cause me problems. I wouldn't want to start the case unless I had my coffee first because I'd be afraid, let's say I have a long case, I might have a delay in getting my coffee, then I would get a rebound headache and I didn't want that. But it was kind of embarrassing. I'd have to make an excuse to go get a cup of coffee um, and, you know, and potentially delay a case. That's not good. Um, I don't think I slept as deep when I was drinking the two cups of coffee a day because it's got a half-life of like six to eight hours. So even if you drink it early in the day, there's still some on board in the evening which can decrease how deep you sleep. How do you quit coffee? You just taper it. Uh, for example, I would take the, for the next day, let's say I had a full dose the first day. Second day, I'd have 75% of that amount because I used, I used to spoon this instant coffee into boiling water. So the second day, I'd have 25% of that. The third day, only 50% of the dose. The fourth day, 25% and then zero the next day. I had intense cravings for about two weeks. Actually, for the first three days, I felt sad. I think it's because my body was so used to getting all those uh, neurotransmitters, like, you know, your, your glutamate, maybe your uh, dopamine or whatever, but I was like sad for three days after quitting coffee. 
intense cravings for about two weeks, then they tapered off pretty well. I've had friends quit coffee and tell me that they had cravings for two months. But once it's done, you're really glad. All your energy comes back, your mood. Caffeine often perks you up for a little while after you drink the cup, but then you get this afternoon uh, lag where you don't feel so great. You, you feel better all throughout the day when you don't have caffeine on board. And my morning energy is just as good as it used to be. Um, Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about diabetes and the thing to remember about diabetes, this is sort of a staging system that I made up and the way it works is, I mean, I read tons and tons of papers on diabetes, but then I wanted to put it together and I was surprised that someone else hadn't come up with this. I mean, don't get me wrong, Shellman has the ectopic fat, fat theory, Roy Taylor has the twin cycle theory, okay, but I'm going to go into a little more detail and I think to help the patient understand the overview here. Basically, you first accumulate fat in your fat cells and by that I mean in your belly fat. Your subcutaneous fat means just beneath your skin. Your deep visceral fat is deep in your belly. Um, and then the next spot where you start accumulating fat is in your skeletal muscles. And in your skeletal muscles, that's a real problem because normally after you eat, your skeletal muscles are about half your body weight. Let's just say in the ballpark of 50% of your weight. <clears throat> they store a lot of glycogen. And glycogen is the polymer of glucose. And that's supposed to happen. About 80% of your uh, food that you eat, the glucose in it, uh, right after eating is called postprandial. So about 80% of your postprandial glucose should be going to your muscles to be stored as glycogen. But when there's insulin resistance due to a high fat diet blocking the muscle's ability to take up the glucose, that fat keeps that, that glucose keeps circulating in the blood. Over time, you're going to lead to accumulating fat in the liver. And so muscle insulin resistance causes postprandial hyperglycemia, all right, because a delay in the ability to get the glucose into the skeletal muscle for glycogen production. Glycogen in the muscle is just used by that individual muscle. Then the next thing is the liver. The liver will start to progressively accumulate fat. And when the liver accumulates fat, it eventually gets to the point where it loses the ability to monitor blood glucose level and to regulate blood glucose level. And uh, what that will lead to is it will keep on running gluconeogenesis, releasing glucose into the blood even when the blood glucose level is high. So now you're going to have fasting hyperglycemia. You're also releasing fat into the blood and you're going to have atherogenic dyslipidemia, just meaning a tendency to make atherosclerosis due to elevated blood fats. Then you're going to start accumulating fat in the pancreas. And you see this all the time, a fatty atrophic pancreas on CAT scans of the abdomen. Any radiologist will tell you, even though most won't know that that's associated with diabetes, chronic diabetes. And once this pancreas is severely fatty atrophic, it's not coming back. I've never seen one come back. So you want to try to reverse the diabetes as fast as possible, the type 2 diabetes, before you have a irreversible destruction of the pancreas beta cells, the ones that make insulin. And, you know, the way it works is your skeletal muscle cell has glucose type 4 transporters that come up to the plasma membrane. They're stored in cytoplasmic vesicles in the con when insulin is bound to the receptor in the skeletal muscle. Okay, but when you have insulin resistance due to the accumulation of fat in the skeletal muscle, it'll block those glucose type 4 transporters from coming up to the plasma membrane. Now blood glucose stays high. That's hyperglycemia. And here's the problem. You also get hyperglycemia when the insulin, when the liver has insulin resistance. There's certain cells in our body, like in the retina of the eye, they cannot control how much glucose comes into, glucose comes into them. It's just dependent on the blood concentration. So if you have chronic elevated blood glucose, hyperglycemia, the retina cells become flooded with glucose in a bad way, and they is called call it overnutrition, and that damages them. That's diabetic retinopathy. Uh, similar process occurs in the kidney, diabetic nephropathy, in the peripheral nerves. You get a peripheral neuro neuropathy, um, lots of atherosclerosis with diabetes. So especially distal small vessels is like a so-called microvasculopathy, and that's in part because the endothelial cells, like the retina and the kidneys. They cannot control the amount of glucose they take up. So that causes the overnutrition effect and you know injury to the mitochondria and dysfunction. And so you block off these little tiny arteries in the foot, you're screwed. Because if you block off, let's say, an iliac artery, you could bypass around it, you could stent it. But these little tiny arteries of the foot, there's nothing you could do. There's nothing to bypass distally. There's, they're too small to stent. So the patient just gets their foot chopped off. You ask anybody that works in, a, in any type of big hospital, they'll tell you they see a bunch of diabetic amputations every day. It's a very, very common procedure. And these small arteries, the arteries that go to the Johnson, the pudendal arteries, only about 1.5 millimeters. The carotids that go up to the brain, about 6 millimeters. Coronaries, about 3 millimeters, approximately. 
and then the pudendal is about 1.5. The point I'm saying is a 1.5 millimeter diameter artery, it doesn't take a lot of atherosclerosis along the wall, called mural atherosclerosis, to plug that up. Quite often the Johnson goes first. So the poor guy, you know, he's screwed. He doesn't even know what's going on. He doesn't even know he's sick. All of a sudden this Johnson doesn't work anymore. And if those arteries are fully occluded, Johnson's not coming back. If they're only partially narrowed by atherosclerosis, he might be able to keep it going for a while with Viagra. But a much smarter move is eat the right way and you know, minimize the atherosclerosis in Johnson and hopefully you keep it working. Okay, this is just a little bit more detail about fatty liver and how, you know, in nature, we normally don't have hyperlipidemia because you don't have access to that much fat food. So our body perceives hyperlipidemia in the blood as starvation. And this confuses the liver. Okay, we're designed to be herbivores. We're not designed to be in high fat two times or three times a day. Um, so a little more detail about it. Because now fatty liver is so common. It's so ubiquitous. I can tell you, whenever the history is elevated LFTs, liver function tests, that patient will almost always have fatty liver. I can also tell you whenever I get an ultrasound of the kidneys and it says, you know, follow up for kidney stones or check for kidney stones, that patient will usually have a fatty liver. Because the same diet produces fatty liver as produces kidney stones. All these diseases go together. People think, oh, I have kidney stones or I have fatty liver. No, you have hyperlipidemia related to eating a high fat diet. Okay, the only good fats are fiber fat. We talked about this a little bit before. Nathan Pritikin summed it up pretty well. Fat is bad. Um, it causes leaky gut and you get all the autoimmune diseases. You get meat-related postprandial endotoxemia, meaning that toxins get into your blood like LPS, lipopolysaccharide from the gram-negative bacteria on the meat, and that causes a generalized systemic inflammation. It's all bad. It's all atherogenic. Um, thick blood. We talked about the blood sludge from the high fat in the blood and the low formation sticking the red blood cells together, especially by elevated LDL cholesterol, but... You know, other lipids will do it even before LDL goes up. And thick blood means less oxygen delivered to the tissues. Over time, it's going to give you more atherosclerosis, heart attacks, death, dementia. Um, you also decrease the function of the blood-brain barrier. And that's associated with increased risk of dementia. There's entire papers on the effect of fat on the blood-brain barrier and how that contributes to dementia. One of the things that concerns me the most is you get insulin resistance in the brain. I'll show a slide of that in just a moment, the illustration of how that works. But when you cannot get enough glucose into those brain cells, those brain cells are hyper-functioning. Um, think about why do you even have a brain? I'll show you a slide in a moment about why do you even have a brain. The reason you got a brain is so you can walk down a path in a forest, a jungle, or prairie, and you could survive, okay? And the key point about that is that neuron is going to have to ramp itself up from 0 to 100 miles per hour in a hurry. You see a wolf, lions and tigers and bears. Man, you got to be ready to bolt or defend yourself real fast. And that's going to require some uh, insulin in a very special way. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, even these so-called these omega-3s get all this hype. Yeah, great. They're associated with prostate cancer, immune suppression, obesity, and everything that goes with that. Okay, what about high-fat veganism? Yeah, this is what I think is sort of like the big bogus thing going on these days is you have to remember there are billions and billions of dollars at stake. These big food companies, they've got, it's no big deal for them to spend a million dollars on advertising, all right? And so what I'm trying to say is the internet is full of all these people. A lot of times they're around 40 years of age, so they look like they have some life experience. And they sit there and they try to tell you all these high-fat diets and high-fat foods are good for you. There is no money in people like me, okay? Low-fat vegans we don't need the medical system, okay? I don't take any pills. I don't go for any medical tests. So in order to make money, you need fat people. Also, if you want to take money away from people, it's easier to take people's money away from them when they're stupid, when they're fat and they're sick and they're stupid, okay? Look, if everybody was healthy and was living to 95 years of age, you know, that could bankrupt the country. They would need lots of Social Security payments made out to them. They would get tons of pension payments out to them. No, no, no. It's much better, imagine you're a corporation, that everybody's eating a high-fat diet. By the time they retire at 65, they're lucky if they live another year or two, okay? Then you don't have to pay them much pension. Then the country don't need to pay them much Social Security. It saves a lot of money. Then they don't get to hand off any inheritance to their kids because they wasted all their, their money in the last you know few years of their life with all their medical bills so what i'm trying to say is you know there was the old queen song fat bottom girls make the rock and world go round and what i'm saying here is 
fat people are great uh, for the economy. You know, I used to all joke, what is the the Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. It's like fat people, well, fat people, you take away the sins of the planned economy. Okay, they're great for the economy. Um, anyways, these are like typical high fat vegan foods to get lots of hype. Olive oil. Olive oil is not good for you. Canola oil had a little less flow, medi di flow mediated uh, vasoconstriction uh, inability to dilate than olive oil. They're both bad. Forget about this crap. Okay, omega 3. We talked about some of the problems uh, obesity, high cholesterol. Uh, immune suppression, lipid peroxidation, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, increased prostate cancer risk. Okay, now the algae is better than the fish oil. It's still bad, all right? Um, why immune suppress yourself and run the risk of potentially increased risk of infection or cancer? Because uh, a lot of people have asked me that about, well, what about omega-3s? We need them because we don't want to get autoimmune disease. And like my feeling about that was, and I agree with like what Dr. McDougall said. He says, the main problem causing autoimmune disease is leaky gut. So why not just fix the leaky gut by being healthy and then you don't need to immune suppress yourself probably. You probably don't, okay? You might have some special case that remains refractory and there might be some rationale for it. But what I'm saying is, if you think you're gonna start from the get-go by suppressing your, your immune system as a way to avoid autoimmune disease, then you're trading one problem for another, okay? Because immune suppression is associated with increased risk of infection, increased risk of cancer. Why not just fix the leaky gut and have no side effects? Doesn't that make a lot more sense? Okay, coconut oil, sat fat, that gets so much publicity. I've had, you know, people get annoyed with me for saying I don't recommend coconut oil. What do I need oil for, okay? You don't need oil. Um, we're not a car. You don't need to oil the car engine, okay? Okay, then, oh, soybeans. Gosh, a lot of people, especially some of these women, man, they love soy. And I, I got, you know, kicked off a, a Facebook thing because I just basically gave, you know, problems with soy. Man, they didn't like me in that group. Um, flax seeds. I mean, they're estrogenic fat with some potential cyanogenic component. I mean, why in the world would I want to eat estrogenic fat? You know, these foods have many, many thousands and thousands and thousands of times more estrogen than other foods. Why do they have it? Because it functions like a, you know, almost like the plant's uh, pesticide. The plant. These some plants want to be eaten. The the bear eats the berries. You know, walks two miles away, takes a dump, and a new berry plant can grow. But soy and flax don't want to be eaten here, so they make tons of estrogen. They don't have breasts. They don't have a Virginia down there. They don't uh, reproduce babies by sexual reproduction, you know, with a Johnson. They don't need estrogen. They're making it as a way to make it like a birth control pill, to make the animal that eats them infertile, to sterilize them, okay? And maybe that's the reason why they're so subsidized, to sterilize all the chumps that want to eat this crap, okay? They've been shown in humans to cause problems with the vaginal lining, the uterine lining, the fallopian tubes, decreasing sperm counts. Okay, there's tons and tons of guys that are all, you know, worried. Their sperm counts are going down, their testosterone is going down. Well, stop eating this crap, genius. Okay, um, avocados, uh, they're only in season in nature for a couple of weeks, so you wouldn't be eating them like you can buy them at the grocery store nowadays all the time. And there's been plenty of people, you know, they'll have trouble losing weight until they avoid all this stuff, including avocados, including nuts. Nuts are 70 to 90% fat. How are you going to keep your total daily fat intake below 10% if you're eating foods that are, you know, like oil is 100% fat, nuts are like 70 to 90% fat, um, it's a bad idea. You know, maybe on the holiday you have a, a couple of nuts, okay, a tablespoon of nuts, but I would not make that a thing. There's a good reason why Esselstyn has the best results in the world and he tells his patient, no nuts. Okay, um, we get plenty of omega-3 from just eating regular plant foods. Dr. Van Dugel's spoken about that at length. There's papers on it. I published the, the papers in my lectures on that before. Um, the body's able to convert the alpha linolenic acid, which is, you know, the shorter one, the C18, into the longer chain, uh, omega-3s, EPA and DHA. That's good enough. We don't really need that much of those omega-3s. If you think about it, your brain cells, you can still remember stuff from your early childhood. That's because those brain cells don't turn over, okay? They don't need that much omega-3. The theoretical benefit is of it is when you're young for brain and eye development, they facilitate more rapid neuronal conduction because they fluidize plasma cell membranes because they're more bent and they thus push the adjacent phospholipid in the plasma membrane 
a little farther away to create space and they fluidize the plasma membrane which is thought to speed up neuronal conduction your neurons fire faster you can see better you can think faster okay but that's for a newborn baby all right and i, I and you the best way to get that is from mama's breast milk okay because when they start supplementing baby formulas they do other things that you don't want we're not going to get into that right now but i'm just saying that's uh, one of the issues so what i'm also trying to say here is in my opinion I think the whole high-fat vegan health food is kind of bogus, all right? It's a way to make all the chumps fat, keep them sick, make money off them. Very low-fat vegan is the way to go. The reason I say very low-fat instead of even just low-fat is because there's a lot of uh, scientific papers, nutritional papers, which I think are dishonest. They go around claiming 30% is low-fat or 20% is low-fat. No, it's not. Below 10% is what I would consider low-fat. So when I'm trying to keep my fat between somewhere in the ballpark of 5 to 10%, I would call that very low-fat. And that's why I think the best foods are things like potatoes, sweet potatoes, and rice, because they all have about 1% fat. That's why the people who eat that are skinny. A billion out of a billion Asians skinny when they were a rice-based population. Okay, here's another key point about diabetes. This is like the most important thing you can know about diabetes. A nice paper, Anthony J. and James Hamilton, 2020, here it is. Uh, putative inhibitors of fatty acid transport across membranes by CD36 disrupt intracellular metabolism but do not affect fatty acid translocations. Okay, that's a fancy way of saying it. So what's the point? The fatty acids were not going primarily through the CD36 protein transporter. They were going straight across the plasma membrane. The rate at which this occurred was just dependent on the concentration of the fatty acids in the blood. So what this means is that there's nothing you could do other than reduce your dietary intake of fat. Because the fatty acid, let's say it's, uh, so here you have the carboxylic part, acid part of the fatty acid. It would be, you know, deprotonated initially. It becomes protonated as it interacts with the phospholipid heads. It then intercalates into the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane. Then it can flip-flop. So this is called the flip-flop maneuver. It can then flip-flop into the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle cell and then enter the skeletal muscle cytoplasm. And this occurred in concentration gradient dependent fashion, meaning that the only way to reduce it was to reduce the amount of dietary fat. And this causes insulin resistance because what happens is these fatty acids, they go into the mitochondria and saturated fat especially, it overwhelms the electron transport chain with electron carriers, things like FADH2. And when the electron transport chain, transport chain is overwhelmed with electrons, too many too soon, it starts going backwards. And then you get this traffic jam effect, you know, blocking Krebs cycle and glycolysis, and then so there's additional things that happen, but it causes insulin resistance and it damages the cell. And this is just a picture showing just being fat. And so all these all these dietary fats are going to make you fat. So the more fat you eat, the fat you wear, like Dr. McDougall says, you're just going to get fat. And once you're fat, your fat cells start eventually to be leaking out free fatty acids through continued lipolysis into the blood. And then these fatty acids contribute to insulin resistance and all these subsequent cascades of reactions caused by insulin resistance. They're all damaging to your body, okay? You accumulate, you know, diacyl glycerol that activates protein kinase and that blocks the glucose type 4 transporters from translocating up to the plasma membrane from the cytoplasm okay you start forming all these advanced glycation impacts, all these bad reactions it's all bad diabetes is a metabolic disaster okay all right what was i talking about earlier with the brain why do humans have brains why do animals have brains but plants do not like voltaire had said because animals move it's, you know, if a plant just sits there, it can just, you know, soak up some water through its roots, get a little sunshine in its leaves. It doesn't need to do much, all right? Whereas an animal, once you walk, you have to do a lot of things. You have to make a value judgment. Walk towards what is good, avoid what is bad. You have to watch out for danger. You have to watch out for obstacles, you know, on a trip over a log. So the classic life cycle is the sea squirt. When it's a juvenile, it has a brain. It looks like a little tadpole and it swims around. When it's an adult, it attaches to a rock and becomes a filter feeder. Its brain is reabsorbed because you don't need a brain when you're a filter feeder. So if you're just sitting around like a, like an adult sea squirt attached to a, you know, the couch watching TV, you know, your brain is going to atrophy. Okay, we previously talked about the deletory theory of mouse equivalence with regard to chronic cerebral hypoperfusion based on his research tying off carotid arteries in mice to cause them to be demented. And the point being is, all of these things are mouse equivalents that lead to the same thing, which is chronic decrease in oxygen and glucose delivery to brain cells, to neurons. And I just include this because diabetes will do that. The diabetics used to check their blood sugar, let's say two or three times in the daytime. 
and not know what it was at night because they would just have to do finger sticks. But now they can get a continuous glucose monitor and they can check their blood glucose every 15 minutes all through the night. They can get a print out of that. And the point being is a lot of them were hypoglycemic at night. So they're dropping the glucose delivery to their brain cells, putting them at increased risk for apoptosis. So when you eat the high fat diets and you're giving yourself uh, diabetes, you are accelerating uh, your risk of brain damage and increasing the likelihood you're gonna be demented at an early age. And then all these other things uh, also cause chronic cerebral hypoperfusion. And most of them are due to ischemia. Lack of ischemia means lack of blood flow, typically due to atherosclerosis, but also combined with uh, vasoconstriction. So when you decrease blood supply to the heart, you can end up getting atrial fibrillation, congestive heart failure. Um, all those things will cause uh, decreased oxygen glucose, glucose delivery to the brain. So what I'm trying to say is, all these things are just permutations on the same problems of diet, primarily a diet. Okay, toxicology factors in a little later when you get into the Rogers theory dementia of neurovascular uncoupling, where the metabolic demand of the neuron is elevated relative to the oxygen and glucose delivery. So here's a typical neuron. Here's, let's call it the beginning of the neuron. This is where the cell body is. Here's the nucleus of the neuron with the DNA. Here's the mitochondria for energy production. These are the dendrites, sort of the incoming information to this neuron. When this neuron fires an axon potential, it'll begin at the axon hillock typically in this region. It'll be transferred down the body of the neuron. And then you'll come to the synaptic terminal. Synaptic terminal is where the synapse is. And these are the NTs for neurotransmitters that are released across the synaptic cleft. And they go and they activate the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, so that's basic neuronal anatomy. And by sending neurotransmitters to this neuron, it exerts an effect on it. And that's how nerve conduction, that's how nerve communication is basically done. Okay, this is just a little more detailed picture showing that the electrical effect of transmitting a nerve impulse is due to rapid opening and closing of these channels, like the sodium channels, for example, and then also the calcium channel here, and the calcium channel causing increased release of these neurotransmitters. All right, so this is called the axon terminal. This is the presynaptic neuron, the postsynaptic neuron, synaptic cleft. Okay. But remember that it all kind of ends up being based on sodium, calcium, and potassium. All right, so here's a typical neuron in your brain. Let's say it's in your hippocampus. When this calcium comes in, because the action potential was fired and in this presynaptic neuron, then calcium comes into the synaptic terminal, and the calcium will stimulate release of the neurotransmitters. Glue stands for glutamate. In this case, that's the most common neurotransmitter in the brain, in the ballpark of about 70% of neurons in the brain transmit glu uh, glutamate. It's an excitatory neurotransmitter. Glutamate uh, diffuses across the synaptic cleft and it binds to a receptor on the postsynaptic neuron. All right, And then it'll cause sodium to come into the postsynaptic neuron, which will depolarize it. It means flip and reverse its uh, membrane uh, charge, and that'll activate other receptors in there. One thing that gets activated is something called an NMDA receptor. That'll come up a lot later. We're not going to get into it right now. But what I'm saying is, Small normal amounts of stimulation are what this neuron is made for. You run into problems with all this stress. Stress causes more glutamate to go across the synaptic cleft. Caffeine causes more glutamate to go across the synaptic cleft. Sleep deprivation causes more glutamate to go across the synaptic cleft. MSG and MFG and aspartame are thought to increase activation of these neurons. Okay. Problems with glycine, which can occur in other contexts. We're not going to get into that. They can also worsen this. So what I'm saying is, if you're taking all these stimulants, you know, sleep depriving yourself is an equivalent of a stimulant. If you're taking caffeine, that's an equivalent of a stimulant. You're going to increase the metabolic rate of this neuron. If you're simultaneously eating a high-fat diet, you're going to drop the oxygen delivery of this neuron. Let's say in the, di the diet is salty. You're going to vasoconstrict narrow the arteries that supply this neuron with oxygen and glucose. So you're going to decrease its energy supply. Also, when you have a typical processed food meat diet, you're going to be high in sodium and you're going to be low in potassium. And when that is chronic and persistent, it damages these gradients across these plasma cell membrane. The cell needs to maintain a very high gradient of sodium because that's coupled to uh, pumping out calcium. If you're not able to adequately pump out calcium, you'll have a tendency to accumulate calcium inside this neuron, and that could lead to excessive release of this neurotransmitter, thus increasing the metabolic demand of the postsynaptic neuron. So the bottom line is everything bad happens by excessive dietary fat and excessive dietary sodium. And good things happen when you get more potassium 
and you get more magnesium, which of course come from plants. Okay, big surprise. It always works out that way because our natural species specific diet is to eat predominantly plant foods. Okay, and because the Americans have had done so much damage to themselves from uh, decades of eating a poor diet, that's why they want to be 100% plant based. Because it's, I, I look at it as like a recovering alcoholic or smoker. You don't tell them you can have one drink a day or one cigarette. Yeah, you tell them none. The only thing you end up needing to supplement on a low-fat vegan diet typically is just B12. Okay, here's the hippocampus, memory center of the brain. This is just a CA1 area of it is in particular sort of sensitive to hypoxia, hypoglycemia. And so this is a key part for memory. This is cerebral cortex. Cortex is like the word in Latin for bark, bark of a tree, because like a tree stump, it's along the periphery. Okay. Okay, now here's the reason I showed you this. You're going to read in all the old textbooks, and, and just to share with you again, you might have heard me say this before, all the, the textbooks of, of, of conventional medicine, they're all wrong. They're all so wrong, it's not even funny. Okay, and when I say that, I know at first you think, oh, am I just being arrogant? Am I being delusional? No, I know exactly what I'm talking about. In med school, I graduated first in my class. I won the award as the best pathology student, for example, out of 333 students in my class. And I have some time now. My kids are older. They're grown up. I don't spend that much time with my wife. So I sit around reading. I go back through the textbooks. And these are the Ivy League textbooks. These are the most famous ones you could read. This will be, you'll see, even like the Ivy League textbook of cardiovascular physiology, they're going to say all kinds of stuff it's completely wrong. Okay, let me just give you a couple examples. They will tell you 90 to 95% of hypertension is essential hypertension as an unknown. But, you know, you can see, you look at the Yanomamo, populations that eat plant-based and don't add sodium to the food, they have zero hypertension. We know that high dietary fat and high dietary sodium cause hypertension. So the book is completely wrong on that, okay? What else? They'll talk about coronary artery disease. You know, it's not exactly clear. Elevated cholesterol is related to it. You need to treat these patients with statins, stents, and surgery. But we know you put them on an Esselstyn diet, you get 100% cure rate, whereas you don't really cure the atherosclerosis ever with these um, uh, stents or surgeries. Zero cure rate, okay? They still have diffuse atherosclerosis after you perform those surgeries. You put them on a statin and you just trade one problem for another. You might decrease their risk of death from coronary artery disease a little bit, but you increase their risk of death for other reasons, okay? Um, and it goes on and on. In the autoimmune disease chapter, there'll be nothing on leaky gut. So I just tell you this so you can realize, you know, that these books can give you some general information that's useful, but if you want to practice you're, you know, trying to cure a patient with those books. You're kidding yourself. You have to go into the medical literature or know about it and the nutritional literature. Otherwise, you're dealing with information that's 50 to 100 years out of date and, frankly, completely wrong. So how does this relate to the brain and uh, diabetes and glucose? Well, here it is. If you look at the typical book, it's going to tell you that the brain is not insulin dependent. Insulin is irrelevant to the brain. The brain gets all the glucose it needs because it has these glucose type 1 transporters across the BBB, blood-brain barrier. So glucose can go into the brain parenchymal region. And then the neurons have what are called glucose type 3, number 3 here, transporters that allows glucose to go right into the neuron. And you don't need any insulin. These are not insulin dependent. Glucose type 1 and glucose type 3 transporters. Glucose type 3 transporters. Okay, so what's the point? Well, guess what? The brain cells also have glucose type 4 transporters in the hippocampus, in the substantia nigra, which is related to Parkinson's disease, and in a whole bunch of other areas. And what does that mean? It means the neurons are highly dependent on insulin to get adequate amounts of glucose in when they're more metabolically active. So insulin resistance is a giant big deal in the brain. And what this is going to lead to is patients with insulin resistance, these diabetics, their brain cells are starved of glucose. They're starving in the midst of plenty. Despite the fact they must have just stuffed their face with a high-fat meal with a lot of sodium, the brain cells can't burn those fatty acids. The brain cells are not good at beta-oxidation of fatty acids. And then they can't get enough glucose in there uh, because of uh, the insulin resistance. So the brain cells screwed. It, despite all this stuff floating, floating around in the blood, the hyperglycemia and the hyperlipidemia, it can't be used in adequate amounts by the brain cell. So you got brain cells dying of starvation despite high blood glucose and high blood fats. Does that make sense? Because of the insulin resistance, they can't get the glucose in. And at baseline, they can't effectively burn fats. So the neurons are screwed and they lose these neurons. And that's a big part of the explanation why diabetic patients are so cognitively impaired. They're so pathetic and clueless, you just feel sorry for them. You know, I, I've had these conversations with all these diabetics, you know, you know, I'll tell them, you know, you just had your foot amputated, you know, you're at risk to lose your other foot. 
you know, you're going blind, you're on kidney failure, you're on dialysis, you might want to try to fix their diet. And I mean, it's the same old thing. Oh, doc, at my age, what are you going to do? Oh, gosh, they're just fading into oblivion and you can't save them. It's sad. It's pathetic. All right. So anyways, here's a normal uh, artery and a small artery arterial. Actually, we're going into a capillary now. So a little capillary. It has a capillary basement membrane here. These spindle shaped cells, that's a little nucleus right there. These line the arteries, uh, line the capillaries. All, the lining of arteries is always endothelial cells. Endo means inside. Okay, so outside of them, this yellow line here is the capillary basement membrane. All right, and so the point of this diagram is that the red blood cells bend a little bit as they pass through the capillary. The red arrow shows the direction of flow. And as they pass through the capillary, they give off oxygen. These blue circles are the oxygen. The oxygen passes through the capillary wall and goes into the neuron. And they deliver plenty of oxygen. That keeps your neuron healthy. When you got diabetes, as well as hypertension, over time, this capillary basement membrane, the yellow line here, becomes markedly thickened. Less oxygen is, be able, is able to be delivered to the tissues. When these cells don't get enough oxygen, they can't make enough energy. And eventually, if their metabolic demand is too high relative to the oxygen and glucose delivery, the neuron will die. And it'll, if it happens slowly, it goes into program cell death. If it were to happen suddenly, like entire big artery occluded, that would be a stroke with frank necrosis, lysis of the plasma cell membrane. Versus apoptosis happens gradually. So these neurons just keep dying left and right, and nobody can see what happened. You can't see anything on a brain MRI. You can't even see anything on autopsy except it's just atrophic. Okay, the green cells here with the vascular smooth muscle. So when I'm, the reason I show this to you is that the more time goes by, the worse it gets, the more irreversible damage one gets to their capillary basement membranes, and the more neurons are lost. And then here's another thing that's interesting about why diabetic patients tend to be so stupid is because they run into this problem of what are called the mitochondrial-associated membranes. And what I'm talking about here is the endoplasmic reticulum. In our old textbooks, it was drawn as just this little focal thing adjacent to the nucleus, and it's sort of a packaging plan for making proteins and sending them out to their future destinations. But in reality, it's like a reticular, lace-like, net-like thing that's all over the cell. It's like almost everywhere inside the cell, outside the nucleus. And it has what are called MAMs, mitochondria-associated membranes, meaning that it has little membranous extensions that go right up next to the mitochondria. And these are very important for rapidly ramping up metabolic activity in a neuron when it suddenly needs to go from zero to 100 miles an hour. So you're walking down a path in the forest, all of a sudden there's a pack of wolves. Oh shit, I gotta climb this tree really, really fast before these wolves eat me up. Okay, so <clears throat> what's gonna happen is this neuron is gonna be suddenly activated to the maximum. And so it has to have a way that it can rapidly increase its metabolic rate. And the way it does it is, the calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum passes through these mitochondrial associated membranes and it enters <clears throat> into the mitochondrial matrix. And that causes a very rapid increase in the mitochondrial enzymes of Krebs cycle so that ATP production can be wrapped up, ramped up super fast. Um, the MCU is a mitochondrial calcium uniport. That's what MCU stands for right here. So you really need this to have a, a highly functioning cell. And... Um, if your metabolism here is not working correctly, and here's how things get screwed up, you'll have calcium rapidly going into the mitochondria demanding um, more glucose be burned as all these enzymes are upregulated. But if you've got insulin resistance, you can't get this glucose into the uh, brain cell fast enough. And because you can't get the glucose into the brain cell fast enough, you can't run your um, glycolysis, Krebs cycle inside the mitochondria fast enough. The endoplasmic reticulum doesn't sense that that well. In nature, this doesn't usually occur that people are insulin resistant. This is a modern world, fat available, three meals a day, all day long thing. Okay, it's not an ancient world thing. And so because of that, they can get um, excessive calcium going into the mitochondria and causing damage to the mitochondria. All right, so this is a mechanism of mitochondrial damage uh, in diabetes. I thought that was pretty interesting. Okay, so you got to lower the fat. If, if you want to see like the best paper ever written on diabetes, here it is. I got the reference here. Pathobiology of Diabetes Complications, a Unifying Mechanism, the Banting Lecture 2004 by Michael Brownlee from the Journal of Diabetes. Okay, this paper is available at the American Diabetes Association site. If you sign in, you can watch his video. This is not even just a great paper. This is a work of genius. This guy deserves a Nobel Prize. They'll probably never give him a Nobel Prize because they want to keep it a secret, okay? This guy figured out diabetes, all right? It's, it's just 
you're, it's just, you're like in awe when you read this paper. It's so brilliant, okay? And then the other guy who came along uh, won the Banting Award. So the Banting Award is like the person who's like the best diabetes researcher in the world. So he won it in 2004. Um, Shellman, Gerald Shellman from Yale, won it in 2018. His lecture is available on YouTube free, and it's extraordinary. I mean, if you want to really learn diabetes, those two things are like the best. Um, I've got a whole bunch of lectures on it that clear everything, but these are the guys who actually did the research, Brownlee and Shellman. Um, and it's it's just works of genius. It's it's magnificent. It's so great. Both of the work they did. Okay, well that's the end of uh, part eight on causes of diabetes, where we emphasize the effects of stress and the effects of uh, diabetes.